welcome to another big train tour at the Colorado Railroad Museum. This week we'll be taking a look at one of the museum's earliest acquisitions, Denver and Rio Grande Western narrow gauge locomotive number 318. Purchased in 1954 by museum co-founder Cornelius Hauk, it was moved to Bob Richardson's narrow gauge museum and motel in Alamosa and then here to Golden just a few years later. Today, this venerable locomotive is prominently displayed right here at the museum. Hi, I'm Paul Hammond, Executive Director here at the Colorado Railroad Museum. Our subject locomotive today is well known as number 318, but that's not how it started life. Like many steam locomotives built for narrow gauge railroad lines, this unique survivor had multiple identities throughout its history. It sported at least three different numbers, plus a name, at different times during its service life, and was owned by two different railroads over the course of its nearly 50 years in active service. This venerable Colorado locomotive was built by the Baldwin Locomotive Works of Philadelphia in 1896. It was numbered eight and also named Goldfield after one of the mining towns in the Cripple Creek District. The locomotive is what's known as a consolidation in terms of its wheel arrangement, or a 2-8-0. This means that it has two leading or guide wheels, eight driving wheels, and no trailing wheels. Number eight was one of a group of four identical locomotives purchased by the Florence and Cripple Creek a railroad line that was the first to reach the mining bonanza district of Cripple Creek in 1894. Gold had been discovered there just three years earlier and the town was booming. Although Colorado was in the midst of a significant economic downturn caused by the Silver Panic of 1893, Cripple Creek wasn't affected because it was primarily a gold mining area rather than silver. The railroad's route was a fascinating one. It started at a junction with the Denver and Rio Grande in Florence, located a few miles east of Canyon City along the Arkansas River. From Florence, the line headed north, eventually joining the watershed of Eight Mile Creek. The route then continued through a scenic watershed area known as Phantom Canyon, crossing high bridges and long trestles and tunneling twice through the steep canyon walls alongside the creek. Eventually the line emerged from the canyon, then climbed rapidly on a route that doubled back on itself to ascend into the mining towns of Goldfield, Victor, and Cripple Creek. Completed in 1894, the new railroad was an immediate success. Locomotives at first were leased from the Denver and Rio Grande, then the railroad's own power began arriving a few locomotives at a time over the next five years. Our locomotive, number eight, came along a couple years into the line's history. The Florence and Cripple Creek quickly became a bonanza railroad, making money for its investors and then some. It even offered overnight through Pullman sleeping car service direct to Denver in cooperation with the Denver and Rio Grande. But competition came to Cripple Creek in the form of two other competing railroad lines, both of them standard gauge. Just 18 months after the Florence and Cripple Creek was completed, competitor Midland Terminal Railway would complete its line into Cripple Creek from Divide to the north, where it connected with the Colorado Midland Main Line. In 1901, another line, the Colorado Springs and Cripple Creek District Railway, would build a third route from Colorado Springs southwest directly up the Front Range to Victor and Cripple Creek. The Little Florence and Cripple Creek the only narrow gauge railroad of the three now serving the district would soldier on for a few more years. It would even build a new main line on its southern end, running direct to Canyon City, where it connected with the Denver and Rio Grande and the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe railroads. A combination of labor strikes at the mines, and more pressingly, a major washout of the line through Phantom Canyon in 1914 would lead to its demise just 20 short years after the railway was first completed. Recognizing the futility of competing against two standard gauge railroads, 
the narrow gauge's owners decided not to rebuild. Today, the unpaved Gold Camp Highway follows much of the former Florence and Cripple Creek from US Highway 50 north to Cripple Creek. Our subject locomotive, along with most of its siblings from the railroad, were stored for a time. They were known to have been maintained well since the Florence and Cripple Creek had been financially healthy for most of its life. Thus, most of the line's locomotives were eventually sold to other Colorado railroads. The Denver and Rio Grande was faced with increased traffic as World War I ramped up. But it was short on cash due to its equity having been used to finance a connecting line, the Western Pacific. Thus, the Rio Grande purchased the former number eight in 1917 for $2,000 and assigned it a new number, 428. Together with five of its siblings from the Florence and Cripple Creek, number 428 comprised its own locomotive class on the Rio Grande. The entire class was renumbered in the 1920s and number 428 became number 318. The locomotive would retain this number until the very end of its service life in the 1950s. The class designation C18 was a Rio Grande standard. In this case, code for consolidation, C, and 18,000 pounds of tractive effort, 18. Throughout the 1930s and 1940s, number 318 spent its time pulling passenger and freight trains primarily based out of Salida, Durango, and Montrose. It made short runs out of Pagosa Springs before that Rio Grande branch line was abandoned during the Great Depression. And in the early 1950s, it pulled the final narrow gauge trains to run on the Denver and Rio Grande's Westerns branch line to Ure and Ridgeway. In 1954, Cornelius Hauck acquired locomotive 318 from the Denver and Rio Grande Western and put it on public display at the Narrow Gauge Museum in Alamosa. Founded by well-known Colorado Railroad historian and photographer Bob Richardson, this museum was the genesis of today's Colorado Railroad Museum, and Hauck became Richardson's financial partner in the enterprise. In 1958, the museum moved to its present site in Golden, and number 318 came along as part of the move. A new Iron Horse Motel was built adjacent to the new museum site on the hopeful assumption that it would help pay for the museum. It didn't pan out. Eventually, the decision was made to create a nonprofit entity to receive the museum's collections and to operate the museum. This arrangement has worked well in the years since and continues to this day. Number 318 first ran in 1978 at the museum, pulling the very first Santa Claus trains that fall. The locomotive operated under steam thereafter periodically, but was out of service by 1982. During that time, there were no formal mechanical facilities at the museum. All work was done outdoors with weather being a constant challenge. Ultimately, however, the condition of its boiler mandated that number 318 no longer be operated. Number 318 went through a difficult time in the years after 1982. It had been taken apart and it stayed in pieces for a time, not looking much like a complete locomotive at all. Following completion of the museum's roundhouse, under then executive director Chuck Albee's guidance, the locomotive was brought inside and cosmetically restored, emerging in 2011. Today, number 318 is posed in the museum rail yard, pulling a train of Rio Grande stock cars. This beautifully restored Denver and Rio Grande Western steam locomotive had its cab partially rebuilt in 2019. It remains a wonderful example of a Colorado narrow gauge railroading icon that has traveled a long and winding road during its interesting life. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you've enjoyed our tour of Denver and Rio Grande Western locomotive number 318. I also hope that your appreciation for Colorado's rich railroad heritage continues to grow with each and every tour of the museum's collections.
If you enjoy our content, like, comment, share, and subscribe. Sharing and commenting in particular may qualify as virtual engagements for important funding programs like the SCFD.